Okay, now let's um, apply our two by two matrix, our decision making matrix, to our hypothesis testing procedure. Okay, so I'm going to set this up two by two. Okay, <clears throat> and here's what we're going to do. Now, we're going to deal with reality here. And the reality here is that either the null hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is false. Okay, so we can do it this way. Null hypothesis true, null hypothesis false. Okay, but I want people to be able to toggle back and forth between talking about the null hypothesis and talking about a treatment effect, right? If we're talking about the effects of alcohol on reaction time, or if we're talking about the effects of the red food coloring on taste perception, or if we're talking about calcium and its influence uh, on uh, neuronal firing, um, if we say the null is true, that means that the treatment doesn't work right? If the null is true, let me put it this way. Let me make it, let me make it easier. So if the null is true, we're saying there's no treatment effect, right? And if the null, if the null is false, that means that we have a treatment, okay? So null is true means that Right, the treated population and the normal are the same, so there's no treatment. If we reject the null, then we say that there is a treatment. There's a difference between those populations. Take your time. Take your time and think about this. This is not going to come quickly. Okay. Another one of my frustrations or pet peeves, perhaps, is that people think that they can't understand something if they don't get it quickly. This takes some deliberate effort and some thinking to get it right. Okay. Now here is <clears throat> the researcher's decision. And of course, we know those two decisions will be that we reject the null or we fail to reject the null. If we reject the null, we're saying that we think there's a treatment. If we fail to reject the null, we're saying no treatment, right? Okay. So I want you to be, you know, able to think to, to, State this in either way, in the treatment way or in the null hypothesis. The experimenter's decision is going to be based on the data that's collected in our experiment or our survey or we do the reaction time test, whatever it is. That's going to be our data. That's the evidence that we're going to use to make one of these two decisions. Okay, And that's going to be based on our statistical analyses. So all the statistical analyses are done. The experiment's done. The research is going to say reject the null or fail to reject the null. In reality, one of those two situations is true, right? I mean, it's just like the meteorologist. I mean, it's either raining or it's not raining, or the snowstorm is you know happens or it doesn't, or the person committed the crime or they didn't, right? This is reality. So we're trying to make an inference about what's happening here. We never know what reality is. If we knew what reality was, there's no reason to do research. We know the reality, okay? So let's look at the quadrants here. And in fact, if you want to stop the tape and see if you can fill in the quadrants uh, correctly, you can do that. But here's what we're going to do. The experimenter rejects the null based on the data that's collected. The experimenter rejects the null and says there's the treatment. Well, if there is a treatment in reality, then the experimenter is correct here. 
you know, we call this our hit. It's a hit because the experimenter rejects the null, the null is false, the experimenter thinks there's a treatment, there really is a treatment, boom. Okay? That matches, so we have a correct uh, decision. The experimenter rejects the null, but in fact, the null is true, there is no treatment. Now, sometimes people are like, well, why would an experimenter, why would the researcher reject the null if there's a treatment, excuse me, if there's no treatment? Well, once in a while, you will get a weird, normal, right, weird, untreated um, outcome. So it can be out beyond that 1.96 or below negative 1.96 but that's actually from the untreated population, from the normal population. But it doesn't happen that often, right? So this is what we would call an error. The experimenter doesn't know reality. The experimenter does not know what reality is, and so you never know whether you're here or here when you reject the null, okay? This is a miss, okay? If the experimenter fails to reject the null, fails to reject the null, the null is true, the experimenter is saying there is no treatment, and there really is no treatment, then of course this is a correct decision, another hit. If the experimenter fails to reject the null, but there really is, but the null is false, that is they say there's no treatment, but really there is a treatment, then this is an error as well, another miss, okay? Now, again, sometimes people get lost, get caught up here, and they say, well, why would the experimenter fail to reject the null if there really is a treatment? Well, just like you can see by chance, just like you can see a treated group uh, excuse me, an untreated group look like it's treated. You can also see a treated group that looks like it's not treated. That's a possibility too. Okay? So once again, we would like to be here or here. We don't want to be here or here. But when we make our decisions, we never know whether we're correct or not. You know, the jury, even if the jury in a trial says someone is guilty, it does not mean that they are guilty. It means that the jury thinks, based on the best evidence, that the person committed the crime. Okay? If the jury says not guilty, it doesn't necessarily mean the person didn't do the crime, but there's just not enough evidence to convict the person. Okay? So, again, inferences, guesses, are always subject to error. Now, we talked about the other uh, decision-making matrices, and we talked about one error as being worse than another error. Is that true here for research as well? And the answer is yes, it is. So which one of these errors would be more serious? Well, here's the deal. When you make a false claim about a treatment, that is, you say there's a treatment, but really there isn't, and we never know if we're doing that. This is considered the worst of the two errors, especially in science, because science is a cumulative endeavor. That is, I'm going to base my research on what you reported. You're going to base your research on what somebody else reported. And so, in a way, we don't want to say that there was an effect of a treatment when there really wasn't. Again, we never know if we're in here, but we can talk about this hypothetically as the worst error, and this is called a type one error. A type one error is when you claim that there's a treatment effect, but in actuality there is no treatment effect. That's called a type one error. Guess what this is called? Yeah, this is a type two error, okay? This is a type two error. Um, it's still an error. We would rather be in this quadrant or this quadrant, but this is seen as less of a problem in science. I'm not saying there's a treatment, but really there is a treatment effect. Right? I'm saying there's no effect of the red food coloring 
when in actuality there is. The reason that that's not as serious of an error is because in science we feel that it will be discovered, right? I'm saying there's no treatment. There really is a treatment. Eventually it'll be discovered. This error, you're claiming there's a treatment, so then people are going to believe that and base more research on that. So it really makes a house of cards that falls down when we finally realize there's no treatment. So this is considered um, the worst of the two errors. Here's where we want to be. Here's where we want to be. This is the worst error. Okay. Now, just because of the way we do research, we usually are doing research to, to try to discover a treatment effect. So this is kind of where we're hoping to be, right? To say that there's a treatment when there really is, this is the worst error. This is correct, but it would mean that we're looking to see no treatment, which is kind of weird. So usually we're sort of up in this half of the matrix. You can rewatch the last 10 minutes of this video if you want to hear this again. It's very important, okay? Um, this is how it's set up. Because I want to show you um, in graphic form what each of these things look like, okay? And so um, hopefully you've taken notes and you have this in your notebook now. You have it jotted down because I'm going to kind of convert this now to a, uh, to a graph. And the way I'm going to do that is to entertain the two possible realities and see what happens with the researcher, okay? So I'm going to do this reality first, because these, these two realities cannot coexist. Either the treatment has an effect, uh, has an effect or the treatment does not have an effect, right? Those are the two realities. Either there's no treatment or there is a treatment. And then we'll see what the researcher does. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to look at this after I make the graph. <clears throat> then I'll try to do a mini version of it. Okay? So if the reality is that the null hypothesis is true. And let's um, remind ourselves about the null hypothesis. That's saying that our treatment group is equal to what I see normally, okay? So that's a symbolic representation. We've been writing this for our hypothesis testing all along. Um, the reality is the null is true. Let's see what happens. We're going to actually play God, right? We're going to say, okay, suppose this is the reality. Well, I mean, if we knew reality, we wouldn't be doing research. We wouldn't be trying to guess about what reality is, right? But we can entertain the possibility, okay? Just like if I said, well, suppose that, you know, we're God and we know that it's going to, uh, there's going to be a snowstorm tomorrow. Let's see how well the meteorologist does, right? So here's what we're going to do. What would the null hypothesis look like graphically? And what it would look like is this. There's only one curve. I mean, there is not a treatment. The treatment is the normal, okay? And so here's the mean for the normal, and that's the mean for the treatment, because there is no treatment. Okay, so there's one curve. This is what the reality would look like. Okay? So we're setting this up as knowing what it is. And then um, we're going to see what the researcher uh, will do. Okay? So uh, the researcher sets up the decision criteria. So here and here, right? The researcher says... I'm going to use an alpha level of 0.05 that corresponds to a Z of plus or minus 1.96. Okay. And 
that's set up in step two of our hypothesis testing, right? So now let's see what happens uh, with the researcher's decisions, okay? So suppose that the researcher picks out this mean, and in fact, we'll make this a sampling distribution, right? Researcher picks out that mean for the group, does the statistics, and what would the researcher's decision be if they saw this mean? What would the researcher's decision be? Remember, so the mean is here, that's the value, so it's not in the extreme 5%. So what would the researcher decide here? The researcher would fail to reject the null, okay, for this mean. All right, well, the researcher fails to reject the null. The null is true. So that would mean that the, the researcher has made the right decision. Correct. It's a hit. What if the researcher gets this mean? Again, it doesn't surpass that 1.96. So the researcher would fail to reject the null. The null is true. It's another correct decision. Correct decision. Correct decision. Correct decision. Okay. What if the researcher gets this mean? Now this is from, this is the normal distribution. I mean, the normal untreated pop population. What if the experimenter gets this mean? What would happen? You know, now this mean is beyond that 1.96. That might be a Z of minus 2.13 or something like that. I'm just making that up. What would the experimenter do? The experimenter would reject the null, but the null is really true. So that mean would represent, the decision based on that mean would represent what? A type one error. The experimenter rejects the null. They say that they think there's a treatment, but really there isn't, okay? Researcher makes this, sees this, sees this, all of these will result in a correct decision. The researcher will fail to reject the null, and the null is true. So all of this is correct. If the researcher gets over here, they're going to reject the null, but it really is coming from, because we've decided, we've made this argument, then that's going to represent what? A type 1 error. So anything in here, when we see any means in there, we're going to make a mistake. We're going to reject the null when the null is actually true, okay? And if that's the case, that's a type 1 error. So how often does that happen? What is the probability that you're going to make a type 1 error? Well, 5%. In fact, the probability that you're going to make a type 1 error is equal to the alpha level. Because if we used an alpha level of 0.01, do you guys remember when I talked about that? If we put the z-score out here at 2.58, out here at negative 2.58, then... The experimenters, the researcher, the experimenter, I'm using that interchangeably, has less of a chance of making a type 1 error. Okay? If I move my criteria inward, then I would have more of a chance of making a type 1 error. The probability of making a type 1 error is equal to your alpha level. That's a probability. I don't ever know whether I'm making a type 1 error or whether I'm correct, okay? In fact, I don't know when I'm making any error and when I'm correct. But I absolutely can tell from this graph that the probability of making a type 1 error is equal to the alpha level. That's the probability. Pretty low. Scientists are very conservative with saying there's a treatment or not, because we know that a type 1 error is not cool. Okay? 
All right. Let me uh, show you the graphs for the other reality, right? So let's do the other reality. <clears throat> and that is that the null hypothesis is false, which means there really is a treatment effect, okay? And in fact, if we reject the null, then we go with the alternative, which would mean the treatment distribution mean is not the same as what we see normally, okay? What would that look like graphically? Well, here's what it would look like. Okay, let's start with the non-treated or the normal. We have hit it here. And that curve has a mean and a standard deviation, by the way. We're going to make our decisions based on a sampling distribution. But now in this case, we're saying that there is another distribution with a different mean, and that is the treatment distribution. So I'm going to use a different color, but I'm also going to do a, um, I'll do a, a, a dash line here. So let's say that then this, and I've tried to make it the same standard deviation, because remember the last video, we talked about the fact that the treatment is just going to move the curve upward or downward. It's not going to change the variability. That's an assumption that we're going to make, that it's going to have the same variability. Now, so this mean is here. So that's the treatment population. And the variability, this and this should have the same variability. Okay. So this is the treatment curve. Now we have to decide, okay, what's the experimenter going to decide? What's the experimenter going to do here? Um, the researcher. The researcher can't see this dotted line curve. That's what they're, they're trying to make an inference about whether that even exists or not. Going to use the same procedure that we've always used, and that is we're going to set up our decision criteria, right? So this is a z-score of 1.96. This is a z-score of 1.96 on the negative side. If there is a treatment, if the treatment has an effect, then that means that the experimenter's always going to see a treatment block, right? If red food coloring has an effect, then if I give uh, subjects sucrose solution with red food coloring, then it, it's always going to have an effect. But here is the blocks are coming from this distribution, the blue distribution, okay? So we're going to see what happens when we look at these different blocks from the blue distribution, okay? So if the researcher sees this treatment group, what is she going to do in terms of the decision about the null? If we see this, right, this block corresponds to this point in the, in the number line, it's beyond 1.96, and so the researcher will reject the null for this one. Reject the null, and if the null is false, then that is a correct decision. If the researcher sees this blue, sorry about the ink running out here, which happens to be right on the mean for the treatment, it's beyond 1.96, so that's going to be a correct decision. Reject the null, and the null is false. If the researcher sees this blue box right here, 
this blue box, what's she going to do? Right. That blue box corresponds to that mean, and so it's not beyond 1.96, and so in this case, the researcher will fail to reject the null. Right? It's within this expected area for the normal curve. So that treated mean, it's actually treated, but it looks like it's not treated. The experimenter, the researcher, will fail to reject the null, but the null is false. So that represents a type 2 error. A type 2 error. Okay? And a type 2 error, uh, well, let me go through some more blocks. So here, they're going to make the correct decision because it's beyond 1.96. Here, correct decision, I think. Right? Here, type 2 error. Here, type 2 error. Here, correct. Here, type 2. So what we're seeing here is this area, this area now represents, and it's in this curve, this represents type 2 error, and it's given by the symbol, uh, let me go up here, it's given by the symbol beta. So this area in here is the probability of a type 2 error, okay? In this case, then, all of this area will be um, where the experimenter is making the correct decision if the null is false. And this, this area here we refer to as the area of power. Okay? Power sounds good, right? Because it is. Power is our ability to correctly identify that there's a treatment or to correctly reject the null. That's power. Here is beta. That's the probability of making a type 2 error. Okay? The entire curve, the entire curve is equal to 100%, right? Or 1. Now, I'm going to show you something that's in the book, and they talk about power, and students love to memor oops, students love to memorize this because people like to memorize things. I don't know where that comes from. High school, maybe? It's really, in my opinion, it's, a, it's goofy unless you're a, an actress, um, you know, to memorize your lines or something like that. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird way to learn something. But they, they refer to power as being equal to 1 minus beta. And I'm going to have this now on video record. When I ask you about power, if you say this, I'll give you zero credit. Even though this is true, doesn't mean you know anything, right? I'll show you this. I'm going to do a little bit of algebra here. I'm going to do a little bit of algebra. I'm going to add beta to each side. Okay. Now I'm going to just switch this around in one is actually 1.00. It's a, it's a proportion. I'm going to turn that into a percentage. One hundred percent is equal to power plus beta. Wow, that sounds pretty impressive. Uh, listen folks, here's a hundred percent of the curve. Here's a hundred percent of the treatment curve. Here's that's a hundred percent. And it's equal to the times the 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 uh, sample means where we're going to make a correct decision, and the sample means where we're going to make an incorrect decision. In a way, this is saying 100% of your decisions are equal to the times that you're correct plus the times that you're incorrect. Duh. Right. So whatever mean that, you, that the researcher pulls out of here, they're either going to reject the null correctly or they're going to reject the null and be incorrect. Okay? P 
power is our ability to correctly reject the null hypothesis. Or, if you want to put it in treatment terms, power is our ability to detect a treatment when there is a treatment. Okay? It's our ability to say there's a treatment when there is a treatment. Because if we say there's a treatment when there's not a treatment, then we've made a type 1 error, right? That's how it works. Okay? Now, whereas the probability of making a type 1 error, alpha, the probability of making a type 1 error is constant. It's, it's um, given by our alpha level. So if we choose alpha level of 0 0.5, 0.05, we have a 5% chance of making a type 1 error. Whereas the probability of making a type 1 error is equal to our alpha level, the probability of making a type 2 error, beta, will change dependent upon certain things. Okay? Let me explain. If we look at the distance between the mean for the normal and the mean for the treatment, if we look at this distance, that's referred to as the treatment magnitude. I had a student several years ago, she didn't know what the term magnitude meant. That's the size of the treatment, the treatment magnitude, okay? And so here, you know, what do we, what do we say with the, um, oh, with the uh, neurons? It caused the neurons to fire uh, 11 impulses more per minute, right? From 50 to 61, something like that, okay? That would be the magnitude of the treatment. Now, I have a question for you, and again, if you want to pause the video to see if you can answer this, uh, you're welcome to. Here's the question. If I increase the size of the treatment, so I make the treatment bigger, what would happen to beta? Remember, this is beta here, okay? What would happen to beta? If I move this distribution outward, what would happen to beta? Because this is not going to change, this point, right? If we move that treatment outward, then beta would decrease, right? The probability of making a type 2 error would decrease. But let's talk about it in terms of power. If I make the treatment magnitude larger, the distribution goes out here, that gives me more power. Does that make sense to people? Well, listen. Power is our ability to detect a treatment effect. Power is our ability to detect a treatment effect, or power is our ability to reject the null when the null is false. Okay? Power is our ability to say there's a treatment effect when there really is. If the treatment effect is bigger, it seems like that should give us more power. Right? We're e it's more easy to see that uh, effect. And in fact, that's the case. If I move this curve outward, my power increases, and I'm going to have less of a chance of making a type 2 error. Okay? If the, pow if the treatment is smaller, that is, if I bring this curve closer to the normal, <coughs> if I bring this curve closer to the normal, what happens to power? Well, power decreases. It's harder to see a treatment if it's a small treatment. Okay? So when you're doing research, I mean, if I want to study the effects of caffeine on reaction time, um, if I give my subjects 50 milligrams of caffeine, that's only a half a cup of coffee, right? I may not have the power to make the correct decision. See how this term works? So if I'm going to 
study the effects of caffeine on reaction time, maybe I'll use 200 milligrams of caffeine. That is two cups of coffee. That should, if there's an effect, it should bring this out further, increase the chance I'm going to have power. Okay? Now, why do we use an alpha level of 0.05? I mean, I told you that this is somewhat arbitrary, but it's the point that we've used. Well, listen, 0.05 gives us the probability of making type 1 error, but the alpha level will actually affect our power as well, because 5% is here. If I said, you know, maybe I want to use 1%, my alpha level 1, because I don't, I really don't want to make a type 1 error. Dr. Speck told me that that's the worst error, so instead of a 5% chance, I'm going to make a 1% a chance. Well, if I do that, what happens? My z-score has to go out this way, okay? And if that happens, that's going to eat into my power. So then all this will be beta. So changing the alpha level changes both our probability of making the type 1 error, but also it influences our uh, beta, okay? If we go to from 0.05 to 0.01, that's going to increase beta, decrease power, okay? If I go from 0.05 to 0.10, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring inward my critical, which actually increases my power. Okay, If I bring my alpha from here into here, it would increase my power. But if the reality is there's no treatment, it also increases my type 1. So it's, you know, it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a whack-a-mole game here. Because I want my power to be high, but I don't want it to be so high that I'm starting to risk making a type 1 error. Okay? So, here's what we're going to do. Um, well, let's do one more um, effect. So we know treatment magnitude affects power. The bigger the treatment effect more powerful we are. Uh, I know alpha will affect both power and type 1 error, so we sort of keep it at 0.05, but if you do change it, it will change power and will change the probability of type 1. But let's suppose that, um, you know, I'm, I use that example of 50 milligrams of caffeine. That's not a whole lot of caffeine. I'm not sure if I'd be able to detect that effect, right, if I have the power. So um, what do I do if I want to study something that I don't think is going to cause a large uh, treatment effect? Let me um, redo this graph. And in fact, well, we can do this. Um, I'm going to do it with a dashed line. Let's suppose that you were interested in studying something that didn't have a very large treatment effect. So let's do this. Here's my normal. And then here is this is my treatment mean. This is my normal mean for the populations. Now, I'm assuming, I mean, take a minute if you want to, you know, again, pause the video. You're welcome to do that. Can you identify um, how much power and how much um, beta are here? Well, we would put the, the z-score here and here. And what we're going to see is, boy, we have a lot of beta. There's... What that means is a lot of the dashed line blocks will look like they came from the solid line distribution, okay? Because here's the treatment magnitude. It's pretty small, okay?
And again, we want to be able to do this on the left side as well. It's not always to the right. And so, wow, I'm kind of screwed here because um, if we extend the z-score up like this, this is my power right here. That's it. Not much power, right? But remember, remember, and, and let me go back. And by the way, there's lots of variability. Variability is not our friend when we're trying to see if there's a treatment effect, okay? Because it just gets, uh, it, it's kind of muddy. Everything looks like it comes from one distribution, right? <clears throat> Remember, these are sampling distributions. So we got to subscript this with M, right? And this will be M's too, but it's normal in treatment. And is there a way that we're going to be able to study this little treatment? Because right now we have so much beta. Beta is all in here. Beta and power are on the treatment curve. Beta and power are on the treatment curve. Okay, Lots of beta, not much power. Less than 50% the power, right? That's 50. And so, wow, what do we do here? What do we do? Well, remember what this is. Standard deviation, which we have no control over, really, divided by the square root of n. So if we increased our sample size, it'll make these curves get more scrunched up, right? So then the new curve is, if they're more scrunched up, here's the normal. Here's the treatment. Notice that I have not changed the size of the treatment. I've not changed the treatment magnitude. What have I done? I have decreased the variability. Now I'm going to ask you this. I know it's a little bit funky here, right? But I'm going to ask you, are you able to tell the two tall curves apart better? Or the two fat ones apart better. The two tall ones you can tell you can tell them apart more, and that's what represents power, right? Because now can I do this? Okay, I didn't change the magnitude of the treatment. I just changed the number of subjects. Okay, so can I do this? Can I do this? Here we go. You see the two curves now. Okay, the solid and the hatched. The experiment is still going to go, okay, 1.96, 1.96, 1.96, right? But now look, this is all we have of beta. So if you are trying to study what you think might be a small effect, what you need to do is increase your sample size, okay? So increasing sample size will result in increased power. Increasing sample size will result in decreased beta, right? Um, increase in your treatment effect, treatment magnitude, will increase power. And changing alpha, I mean, when I say increase alpha, what I mean is going from 0 0.05 to 0 0.10, I'm bringing a z-score in, will also increase power, but that will also increase your type one error, okay? So we don't wanna play with this too much. Decreasing alpha will decrease your power and decrease type one error. Wow, lots of stuff, lots of stuff to think about. I would recommend watching this again if you can, if you have the time, okay? But let me just finish by putting up that original, and we're going to say um, 
researcher's decision and reality. And to tell you the truth, I don't know. Uh, I, I I don't have it written down. Um, you can look at the tape or the video, but it doesn't matter. What what do we have here? Uh, did we have reject null and then fail to reject null? And over here we said null is false, I think, and null is true. So this was our type one error. And the probability there is equal to alpha. This is when we're correct, right? We reject the null. The null is false. There's a treatment. We say there's a treatment. Make sure you can go back and forth. Here we have correct. Fail to reject. The null is true. We say there's no treatment. There is no treatment. Make sure that you can do those conversions. And then here is type 2 error. That's given by the symbol beta. This one is set by our alpha level. This one can change depending on where you put your alpha, where how much you know how large the treatment is, and how many subjects you have in your research. This is why if you're working in a lab, <clears throat> or um, you know you're in graduate school or something like that, oftentimes the researcher will say, "We need more subjects. We need more subjects." The more subjects you have in your research, the more power you have. Okay, and so that's always the push. It's not, they don't want to make more work for you. They want to make it so it's you, you're making the best decisions. You have the most power. Okay. All right. And then we'll make a, a big move in the next video as well.